Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. I think we can settle down now. Thank you very much. Um, my name is uh, Kambidima Watela. I'm the academic director in the school and an associate professor in public policy and governance. Uh, I think I need to say this. Some things are better said than left unsaid. Uh, today I decided to come quite early to campus because I wanted to do some work before everybody comes in. Then halfway through my trip, uh, I got a text from my head of school that I have to stand in for him for this series. So I had to make a U-turn because being a, a self-declared leftist, I was wearing camouflage <laughs> and had to go back and put now a jacket on so that I actually also look presentable. Uh, and I think it's for the right reason. Uh, we've had amazing guests and they continue coming in. Uh, I think my task is very simple. Uh, the first is to welcome you to the Vet School of Governance. Um, and I will repeat this for the sake of those who are actually just uh, sort of uh, attending this for the first time. We've been having an election series um, and we've had amazing conversations so far. Uh, and I really like the way we started it. We actually started it with the chairperson for the uh, Electoral Commission. Um, and then we actually spoke to various parties, uh, uh, presidents. Uh, and this morning, we had an amazing discussion on something that concerns us. And yet we try sometimes to stay away from it, which is gender. Um, when the panel was speaking, I didn't want to take all those very nice words, um, philosophy, structuralism. Those are words you use to scare your cousins at weddings and funerals. But I just brought it upon myself. I was brought by a mother. After me, I have four sisters. My firstborn is a daughter. I'm actually surrounded by women. Uh, and it actually starts to resonate. If I have to treat women right, I'm just treating mine right. So gender is about all of us. But I'm, let me shift this, the focus to Sadek. Uh, I am actually particularly very interested that I want to really hear what the conversation will be. The corridor talks are that uh, Sadiq is toothless. What does that even mean? And is that true? Uh, so it would be quite interesting to actually sort of uh, pick up on, on that particular discussion. Uh, the good part is that we have a very, very powerful panel. And I would like to begin by welcoming and introducing Professor Mandaza. Uh, Professor Mandaza is a Zimbabwean academic. Not a problem. <laughs> may, 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 maybe I may ask Prof, is it true? I heard someone tell me that the ringtone exposes your age. <laughs> Yeah, Prof, I was just in the middle of introducing you. Professor is a Zimbabwean academic author and publisher. He holds a doctorate in philosophy and political economy from the University of New York in London, 1979. And he taught at the University of Botswana, Zambia, can I emphasize Zambia, De La Slam, and Zimbabwe, part-time. Um, I wish I could continue reading this bio, but I think we'll all exhaust half the time. So I'm going to quickly run to actually introduce Professor David Sibududu. Have I, have I pronounced that correctly? Sibududu, yeah. I, I actually read this word more than twice to a point where I knew that when I read it, I'll be conscious, then I'll actually 
mess it up some. He's a professor of political science in the Department of Political and Administrative Studies at the University of Botswana. I think we are blessed. Even the previous panel had someone from the University of Botswana. Thank you. <laughs> uh, he served as dean for the Faculty of Social Sciences. Uh, he, he was also head of Department Political and Administrative Studies uh, and coordinator for Demo Democracy Research Project. Uh, thank you and welcome, Prof. Um, may I now move to my colleague? <laughs> uh, <laughs> may I call you that? Uh, yeah, we we yeah. I I want to call you my colleague, um, Professor Karuri Sabina is an associate professor in our school, holds a bachelor degree in computer science and sociology from the U.S. Iowa, master's degree in urban planning and architecture. Uh, from University of California, uh, Los Angeles, and a PhD from this university. Last but not least, may I actually introduce our moderator, Mr. Brian Kagoro. Mr. Brian Kagoro is a managing director of programs of Open Society Foundations, and he brings to this panel 24 years of strategic leadership experience across international and region. May I, at this particular point, uh, hand over to you? But, oh, yes. Oh, okay. Sorry, my bad. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm told this bio came in. Yes. Uh, Pro Professor Agostino Zacharias uh, is a former United Nations representative in South Africa, Zimbabwe, Burundi, and the Comoros. He is a professor in international relations uh, at the University of Joachim Chisano in Mozambique. So we have Botswana, Mozambique, uh, I think Kenya stroke South Africa. We are really, really having a powerful panel. Uh, Brian, may I hand over to you? Thank you. Thank <laughs> you so much. Well, we, yes, I'm, I'm being instructed. Um, so, uh, so to avoid people, mispronouncing his name. Just call him Zach. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so Dr. Agostino Zacharias. Uh, yeah. Uh, just call him Zach. Otherwise, it's a tongue twister. Um, I'm going to start and give each of the panel. So this is what we're going to do. I'll give each of the panel uh, uh, five minutes, three to five minutes. There is actually a clock. Uh, or, yeah, three to five minutes uh, to frame the issues from their perspective. And then what we're going to do is then come back to specific questions. And then I'll come to those of you in the audience who have comments and questions, come back to the panel. And in between, I have said to the panel, this is a dialogue. Uh, so they can have, you know, they can pick up points the other was making, clarify, amplify, uh, as long as there's no mansplaining, they they can do that. Um, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Prof. Karuri said, saved us from being a potential uh, manel. Great. I'm going to ask Dr. Mandaza. You will need the microphone, or Dr. Mandaza, to um, give us a five-minute framing. So, just to put this in context, <clears throat> Sadak is both a geographic space, very specific countries that are members of a particular union, but Sadak is also a historical space. It's, it's got the largest concentration of liberation movements and also the region where per capita you had, if you just take countries right next to each other, fought within the same time, the highest number of liberation fights or liberation wars fought. Uniquely, it's also a region where historically a race uh, within the continent had a massive uh, uh, input and impact in the formation of the social strata of society. 
but it's also a part of the region, like part of East Africa and portions where uh, both liberal ideology and left-wing ideology have since time immemorial struggled to coexist, to contend, and to shape the polity, uh, political consciousness. And so ironically, though, it's a region that has since the colonial moment or moment of colonial occupation had the most restive young people. So when we all speak about Nelson Mandela, we talk, we forget that he once was young. He, was on, he wasn't always in his 70s and 80s and 90s. When we speak about Robert Mugabe, we speak about Ibo Mandaza himself and others, the young people in Frelimo. Samora Michel was very young when uh, he took over Mozambique. Uh, in every country, Angola, in Zambia, in Lesotho, in Swaziland, in young people have always been arrested. Historically, it's a region whose liberation has been shaped by the discontent of its young. Much earlier, for those of you who've read the history of countries like Zimbabwe, you had Nehanda, who was barely 20-something, when she led the men who were afraid to stand up against the, the colonial pioneer column. So the story goes on. But it's one region where women have played a decisive role in liberation as combatants, as intellectuals, as activists. So in a way, Sadak is also a cauldron of ideological contestations, but Sadak is also an economic space, a space where a labor migration has shaped the architecture of how we appreciate who is who and uh, in the region. So identity in this region is mighty problematic. Uh, but also, tragically, it's a region where apartheid and Calabar resulted in the highest levels of immobility for the locals. So you were confined in a Bantustan, in your tribal trust land, in your village, and were taught to be suspicious of your neighbors or to report on them should they gather for purposes. A region with a great economy, but a region with both a painful and glorious history. Where does that situate us, Dr. Mandaza? Sadak in the context of the South African election. What are the key issues? Well, thanks, thanks, Brian. You can hear me? I have to begin, uh, regrettably, with a, a ring of irony. We're meeting to discuss Sadek against the backdrop of failed elections in Zimbabwe, which Sadek condemned as flawed. And I just wonder what is the relevance of Sadek in such discussions. I hope they are Sadek uh, would be officials here. Yeah? We, are, we are really operating in a very dangerous situation where both national institutions and regional institutions are in a flux of despair. Secondly, I want also to, especially since we're in an academic, academic forum such as this, to drop a clangor against this principle or this myth that elections are a key factor in the, the democratic discourse. Uh, something we've been taught by our northern neighbors in northern hemisphere that elections are everything and therefore the observer missions every election and I saw here in South Africa the electoral commission where I actually went to the US embassy uh, in the would be for validation that indeed the election they will follow the well-known route of democratic discourse. I want to remind ourselves as students of uh, the state in Africa, in particular, in the South, that uh, we are a poor imitation of the, of the models that have been sold to us. 
And I just found, uh, by your, found a beautiful quotation from our old man, Sami Amin, and I thought I should read it out. I quote, the state remains in Africa, as in Asia, a purely imported product, a pale imitation of the diametrically opposite European political and social systems, a foreign body, which is moreover overweight, inefficient, and a source of violence. Please find that quotation, keep it close to you when you write your essays on, on the state. It means, therefore, we need to uh, be more circumspect, more introspective when we discuss issue of elections. And, uh, and maybe accept that in the current conjuncture, elections have become more, and the, the concept of political party, which goes with the concept of uh, democracy in the bourgeois democracies, Parties are not the same parties that Lenin and others spoke about. Parties are more planned for elections. Um, to get into power, livelihood. Then about issues, policy, uh, critical matters, for example. Um, and in the South African context, and in Southern Africa in general, the issue that hang over us in this region, particularly here, is the national question. I was discussing with um, uh, Stembiso Somi of the Sunday Times uh, when I read on his Facebook that there were at least 25 parties or more uh, standing for elections in South Africa. And most of them uh, began the, uh, with, the word, with the word African. Uh, African, this African, this African National Congress. And I, it made me reflect that why would one want to highlight that one is African in an African country? And in 2024, 30 years after independence, the national question is big, yeah. And uh, to that extent, I might say that uh, for the time being, and truth resolved, the ANC will continue to run the roost. Yeah, until the national question is resolved, or until there are indications that it be resolved. Uh, I also wanted to say that with regard to SADC, I wonder what would be the lessons to be drawn. I have none, really, uh, that uh, we can draw from the South African elections as, as pertinent to SADC. Was regrettably, uh, South Africa itself has fallen into the same mold like all of us. That maybe we should start looking at the models North Nigeria, where elections have become a, an agency through which to mediate national issues, such as ethnicity, for example. So you have a kind of a conventional, a conventional agreement that this. Turn is north, the next one is south, it's the south next time. So I'm coming to support you, Olga. <laughs> so, so elections, maybe we should discuss them in the context of how they mediate uh, national situations, uh, create national balances, uh, create consensus, and that when that model is flouted, then you have conflict, including ethnic conflict. So we have to understand where we have seen success stories, relatively speaking. Uh, uh, it's, it's the extent to which leadership has been able to mediate these inherent and deep-seated conflicts among ourselves. I'll stop there, Brian. Thanks, uh, David. I don't want to punctuate uh, or to comment on Ibo. Your take. Thank you very much, Brian, for giving me this opportunity to speak and uh, also to thank uh, uh, my senior colleague, Ibo, <laughs> for laying the foundation, although I differ with him on some aspects. But um, we are here today to speak about um, uh, the implications of elections 
of the 2024 South African elections on the SADC region. I think uh, I should start by stating that, as he has uh, uh, rightly pointed out, that uh, South Africa is not an ordinary country in the region. South Africa is a consequential country. It is a country with a consequential economy and with a consequential role uh, in terms of the leadership that it plays uh, within the uh, SADC region. It is also, it's not only a consequential uh, economy, but it is also a security uh, linchpin in terms of the role that it is playing within this region. And uh, I think a, a good example that we can give is the current um, um, uh, operation that is in motion in Mozambique through the Samim. So South Africa is also a gateway um, to, uh, uh, of FDI, that is the foreign direct investment. Uh, to developing countries. So on the base of the role that uh, South Africa plays, so it is important that we appreciate and understand and talk about the importance uh, of these elections, because these are not just ordinary elections. As we are all aware, probably, South Africa has been running as a, a democracy, an electoral democracy, to uh, let me qualify, uh, for the past 30 years or so. So these elections are quite important in the sense that um, they are out there to tell to the world whether South Africa is um, consolidating or regressing. Because uh, if you read the EIEU report, that is the Economist Intelligence Unit report, it seems to suggest that South Africa is a flawed democracy. Because uh, when we talk about uh, a democracy that is uh, matured, we expect it to have both um, procedural uh, and um, substantive dimensions, if you are to cite the work of um, uh, Larry Diamond and uh, Molino. So some of the dimensions that they cite in the literature uh, are missing uh, in the South African uh, context. So because of the role that South Africa plays, its elections, in my view, are quite attractive. Because let's look at it this way. South Africa has got a GDP of over 400 um, um, billion dollars, uh, if you were to use uh, uh, 2022 figures. Its population is sitting at around 60 million. And um, uh, the contribution of uh, manufacturing uh, to its GDP uh, in terms of the 2022 figures is uh, around 14%. It used to be around 25 at some point, much earlier, but it has sort of declined. So on that basis, South Africa is not an ordinary country. It is there to uh, play a key role. So on that basis, I tend to think that if we have positive elections in South Africa, they would go a long way in dispelling uh, what I would call as uh, negative perceptions about our region. Uh, they will go a long way in terms of trying to reinforce positive uh, perceptions uh, about this region. Because as we are all aware, uh, there are a lot of negative perceptions regarding the quality of our uh, elections, the quality of governance within our region. So if we hold po positive elections, I think they will have some kind of a demonstration effect on the rest of the regions. As we are aware, probably, there are a number of elections that are taking place this year. We have Namibia, we have Botswana, and I think Mozambique. Uh, which are coming uh, this year. So if we have positive elections, I think they will play a crit critical role in trying to ensure that the outcome uh, out there uh, is quite uh, positive as well. So on that basis, I think South Africa is not an ordinary uh, country. The other aspect is that uh, if elections were to be positive, um, then it will enhance the security situation uh, within our region. Because a reversal uh, uh, of elections here or a negative elections may complicate our security uh, situation. So as we are all aware, South Africa has become an attractive destination even for migratory flows. To that extent, uh, if we uh, have a positive elections within uh, in South Africa this year, then that would mean that uh, probably uh, some of the migration flows that we've been seeing going in the direction of Europe, they may continue to go in the direction of uh, this region. 
I know some are not <laughs> welcoming that uh, kind of migration, but I think it's not something that we can stop. <laughs> we must face it that uh, migration is not something that we can really halt. It, is, it has always been there. There are reason, various reasons why people move from one country to another or from one region uh, to the other. The other issue is the issue of uh, political stability. If elections go on very well here, uh, it will ensure that we advance and promote uh, the political stability of this region, which is quite important. And uh, as we are aware, the Southern African region has been the most stable region compared uh, to the other regions of uh, our continent. So on that basis, if we have positive elections, I think they will play a critical role, try to promote uh, that uh, stability. The other issue that I think is important, if we were to have uh, successful elections or positive elections in South Africa, South Africa will uh, standing within the region. I think it will also improve. It will also elevate the standing of South Africa. And its influence uh, within this region it will also be elevated. So I think on that basis, uh, positive elections in South Africa are quite important. And I think even the outside players, uh, they will, are also looking at these elections with keen interest. The other aspect, Brian, and um, members of the audience, I, I, I can see I'm running out of time, is the aspect of foreign policy. One of the things that South Africa did uh, in 1994, it made SADC, it's a key priority in terms of its foreign policy. So if we have positive elections, I think that will play an important role in trying to advance uh, the po foreign policy of this uh, uh, great republic. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, David. Uh, Zach, uh, what's your take? I mean, we, we've had two views. Uh, uh, Ibo says, uh, look, uh, there's no lesson I see. Uh, and David say, has given us a whole catalog of potential positive spin-offs or dividends. What's your take? No, thank you very much, uh, Bayou and the bits for inviting me here and uh, to see old friends and also uh, to expose me to okay, sure. this audience. Uh, can you hear me? No, it's on. Your mic. So, folks, is on? I don't know. I mean, I'm okay. challenged with technology. <laughs> I'm BBC. Born before computers. <laughs> technology. <laughs> Is it okay now? Oh, okay. You see. It's now BBI. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I think I consider myself a privilege to because one way I grew up in these meeting rooms when the SADAC was being formed. I was being discussed first as the uh, SADAC uh, SADCC, and then the SADAC when the treaty was being negotiated. I was a young boy carrying uh, briefcases of some important people that were supposed to make these decisions sometimes. You can name them just uh, for um, today. You know, I'm from Mozambique, so you can imagine who am I speaking about. And uh, uh, so the historicals, uh, I had a chance to uh, be with them and uh, even uh, taking tea to them when they were conspiring about these issues. My, my take is that South Africa, and then you, can, you can't imagine the enthusiasm that we had with the prospects of South Africa joining SADC. The enthusiasm that it was a sophisticated society, sophisticated economy, with sophisticated financial system, all that will boost SADC. And uh, the defense industry was here. You could have um, a military industrial complex in the region and uh, all those dreams. So I tend to agree with David that stability of South Africa, either through elections or through policies, it's an important issue that we should not lose sight in South Africa. And if things are going wrong, 
our priority should be trying to fix those things because this is like our backbone and we can't afford to have our backbone being destabilized and we're being harmed or being destroyed. So there's a, a beacon, is our uh, last beacon of hope that South Africa is going to stand. And with a leadership that has shown quite recently in the, uh, taking Israel to the Hague, that courage, which is lacking in many of our states. There's no any African state that has come and supported. There's only Namibia. But uh, our states have not come out in support of that spirit, which was initiated of uh, Sadak being there, has one region with one project of trying to emancipate this part of the continent and trying to build the development in a way that uh, people aspire to be. So uh, uh, despite the facts of being the largest economy in the region, of having a, a sophisticated democracy with all its problems, sophisticated financial system, technological more advanced than many of countries in the region. So South Africa remains that hopeful country that we all would like to be. It's not for um, any other reason that uh, you having problems of migration in the, into South Africa. People believe that we are going to South Africa to have better lives because we don't have better life in, at all. And uh, South Africa was welcoming and the leadership at the time was a country which thought we should embrace Africa because we are part of Africa. But uh, there was a miscalculation. And that miscalculation is that uh, this rainbow nation that we have announced that we want to be, was it prepared to become a rainbow nation where all the parts of the spectrum of that rainbow prepare to embrace and creating this continue living in harmony with each other. All parties were there to outdo each other or continuing with the um, independent interest separated from the interest without having any sentiment of solidarity towards all the parties that have been underprivileged in the previous eras as such. I think this is the key struggle now which shapes politics in South Africa and is shaping the stability of South Africa and also shaping the stability of continent as a consequence. Because if South Africa is not stable, it's going to be very difficult to project stability in the region as such. So I think elections, good elections in South Africa are um, uh, uh, an example that we should all be pushing towards having good elections, having good leadership, a leadership that is capable of looking at the Africa, South Africa and Africa today and projecting Africa in the world and defining the place of Africa in the world. So if we don't have those good elections, then that idea will be compromised. Uh, that desire is likely to be compromised. So I think this is the reason why we should be looking into having a good elections. Thanks, Zach. Prof. So, uh, you know, ordinarily, I would have said the uh, have spoken, uh, but I realized they are all older than me. So, so <laughs> let me just say the men. <laughs> but you know the word I was going to use. Sure. <laughs> men have spoken. Um, what's your take? So 
Th thank you so much. And thanks for the invitation, even though I was just in the parking lot, so I was easy to pull into the panel. Um, I maybe took a different approach slightly to the question, and, and I'd like to assume it's partly because of my positionality as a not so young, middle-aged immigrant African woman who occupies the region with great pride uh, and also with great commitment to the African project. I think to me, the question of projecting the place of Africa to the world on the basis of success, I think we said the positive election mm -hmm. in South Africa for me raises a lot of questions about what a positive election in South Africa means uh, and what the commitment is to the place of Africa for African people. So rather than to the rest of the world first. So when uh, Bayo invited me to this panel and the question was the significance of this election uh, 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 for the Sadak region, uh, initially, you know, I, I thought, you know, as an intellectual, but also as an individual holding those positions, what it meant to me. Uh, and, and to be honest, and I felt a bit pessimistic thinking it, but my immediate answer to myself was, well, it won't matter. Then, of course, I had to go deeper because I had to sit here and sit with men and <laughs> think about what I was going I, to say. I share your problem, <laughs> one. <laughs> Uh, but 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 I think I came up with three things. I mean, one, and I think it's come through from the other panelists, and we did a research project uh, just after COVID, looking at um, the role or the future of multilateral institutions in the region uh, to really take on uh, regional crises. And we've had climate crises. We've got the kinds of democratic crises panelists are raising. Uh, uh, there are many challenges, uh, 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 these trilemmas we continue to face. Uh, the resource governance issues, which I think we barely confront or even speak about, and yes, they're quite significant on the continent and certainly in the region. And, and, and from that perspective, um, what that study found was that, the, and this is actually interviewing people from the multilateral institutions themselves, as well as other stakeholders, uh, and the view was that that is not where we can bank, because they were considered to be weak, by and large, Sadek among them. Uh, uh, they were considered to really be only as strong as the strong member countries, and maybe in that sense, uh, South Africa becomes important. Uh, but the question, I suppose, would would be whether that's where we can bank to say that uh, our, our 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 regional integration, our regional leadership, the Pan African agenda is taking us somewhere, and that these political manifestos, as I'm reading them, this election as it's coming, has anything to do with something positive in that regard. Uh, so a few months ago. Um, uh, Ralph Maketa in an article said that uh, foreign policy is really a major issue in election campaigns in these countries. And he was referring actually to the liberation movement Sadak countries. Uh, and he says, and that's because international relations are seen as the exclu exclusive preserve of political elites. Um, another future is said political parties don't have a sense of what Africa means to them and therefore it doesn't matter for South African parties. Now I went through the, through the manifestos to see whether I could find any different evidence of this. Uh, and to be honest, there's fairly limited African reflection. I mean, obviously, there are some parties who call themselves certain things that would lead to them making specific statements about Pan-Africanism. But by and large, I think there's some indications maybe around free trade, uh, again, not, not, not across all of them. And I really did check through at least most of the uh, uh, big ones. Uh, uh, and many of the others, the references really only had to do with managing immigration issues. Um, and so I think from the perspective of regional leadership, regional integration, I'm not sure that we can count on this election and any of the parties to really do too much for us. The second perspective I take, and this is based on my work, which is around thinking about technological change and innovation was, well, SADC has as one of its key strategies to promote the development transfer and mastery of technology as one of the ways we are going to move forward economically and also socially. So again, we look back to the manifestos to see whether South Africa, uh, at least from a party politics perspective and what people are speaking on uh, uh, offer any promise. So the Policy Innovation Lab at the University of Stellenbosch just completed a small study where they used sort of AI, I think it was mainly a fancy AI project, but what they did was quite interesting, uh, which was to scour the manifestos of all of the parties, or at least uh, a, a number of the major ones, uh, and to really look at how they dealt with digital transformation and what they are saying they're going to achieve. Uh, uh, you know, should they be successful? Uh, and the results were underwhelming. Uh, most of the parties made little mention of anything to do with digital transformation. And to the extent they did, it was fairly instrumental, uh, not, not really about mobilizing technology in any way that would uh, perhaps lead to development or democratization or, or anything like that. Now, 
what's significant about that for me is our own work at the Civic Tech Innovation Network, looking at what Civic Tech is doing in the region in Southern Africa, is also demonstrating a huge growth, by the way, of more and more civic people using digital technologies to get involved, to participate, to, uh, to get involved in their own development. But over 60% of them focused on essentially actions of watchdogging, what I called in one article, be watcher watchering. So we go to vote and then we spend our talent, our time, our energy monitoring uh, corruption, monitoring elections, uh, insisting on accountability, insisting on transparency, rather than doing perhaps what we need to do, which is focus on development and livelihoods, because that's not getting much better on the continent. Mm -hmm. So there the question becomes, are we reaping any dividend actually from this piece we've had? Uh, and are we really mobilizing the best of our technological skills, capabilities in the region for the development that people sorely need? And I don't see any promise of that in the manifestos. The last reflection I had, uh, and it's the third, third and last one I'll share in this round, uh, was, you know, the Human uh, Rights Watch put out a statement, and the title of the article, um, just I think a week or two ago, was Toxic Rhetoric Endangers Migrants Stop Scapegoating Foreign Nationals Ahead of Elections. And I think the title speaks for itself. So for myself, uh, as a person who is foreign born, who votes here, has never voted anywhere else in my life. I feel very present and uh, and, and, and engaged. Um, there's a lot of that. And in fact, what that article refers to, and uh, they actually refer to manifestos, tweets, and statements by a number of the major parties, Rise and Zanzi, I can mention them, right? Mm -hmm. ANC, Patriotic Alliance, Action and SA, and the list goes on, essentially weaponizing xenophobia, as a way to win elections, as a way to pander mm. to populism. Now, how is that about a regional agenda? And how is that, I suppose, and I, I mean, I can personalize it because I can talk about how it makes me feel, but it's not just how it makes me feel. We work with a lot of young people in the civic tech space who are extremely pan-African, who are extremely engaged, who are extremely involved uh, in ways that many of these statements are unreflective of. Uh, and perhaps ignorant of to the extent that perhaps development could come from this space of these youth, they are the dividend we don't often uh, uh, reap. So um, at the end of it, I still ended up in my fairly negative first answering stage, which is there are things that matter for the region. I'm not sure the South African election outcome, at least this year, uh, is going to be one that I see shifting a needle. Wow. Well, well, why don't we give them a pump pump? You all look so excited. Some of you are holding your heads. I don't know whether it's out of expression, oppression, or depression. <laughs> so let's, let's notch it up a little. So fundamentally, what we are hearing is that it matters, but it does not matter, <laughs> this election. And it's quite a, an indictment to have the region's biggest economy go to an election, and the house is divided on whether it matters or it doesn't. But here is an interesting thing. The Americans, in response to South Africa going to the ICG, suggested that uh, they should be sanctioning. Uh, we've had similar noises. And the region collectively supported Zimbabwe in the anti-sanctions campaign. In its expression of solidarity, the region's seniors and political elite is re-adopting an anti-imperial, anti-colonial standpoint. A little distance away from here, in French-speaking West Africa, we're seeing fed up young people adopting a particular posture towards the relationship of their countries with donor aid countries. But generally, the same young people who may agree with their leaders around the critique of the colonial imperial domination are fed up of their leaders on the basis of indigenous factors, non-performance, corruption, cronyism, tribalism, sectarianism, and etc. So the young people say, well, the message could, could be, might be good, 
but the messenger is suspect. There is an irreconcilable gap uh, and a gap that doesn't allow for a united position. So this disconnect between leaders and institutions. So let me go back to you. Let me start with you. Um, and I want Prof to build on something you say. In the region generally, the ownership of technology is in the hands largely of foreign corporates and where it is owned by locals, <coughs> it's a small clique or cartel. Within the context of the South African election, what are the levels of misinformation, disinformation, racial profiling, we've already talked about profiling on xenophobia, or what are the, ex the extent to which narratives about history and the future are arising that may be problematic, right? So I'm going to say that I'm an African, and in the speech he described the various racial groups, ethnic groups, and class groups that make South Africa. Is the narrative, or are the narratives in this election uh, building up to Zach's notion of rainbow nation? Uh, Zach, I'm reminded that the rainbow has no color black. So I'm, I, I don't know, I'm not sure how South Africa became a rainbow nation, you know. Uh, so, but, <laughs> that is the <a> problem. <laughs> so, Prof, and then Igor uh, will come from Prof to you. The, the picture you've painted, Sadat is being repolonized. Latin Latinam here, Chrome uh, here. So, the elections are an expression of the state primitive accumulation projects. And these projects have become trans boundary, transnational, cross region. The elites in the region are not tribal, they are not racial. They are united across borders, they are united across even uh, levels of education in order to assure their accumulation projects. So they can use race and class and other identities in order to keep the poor people busy killing each other whilst they are dealing with the accumulation projects. So after Prof, please, I would like to hear the link, any of you, is there a link between the huge interest in climate, climate finance, and et cetera, I mean, any of you can take it as well, uh, and the new elite interest where you are hanging off pieces of land, you are discovering, I think Prof, you talked about. And then David, I mean, you painted a picture of a regional behemoth. My question to you is, is South Africa like me, or the quotation from Sami Amin, overweight but without uh, the ambition to be leader? So it has the status of leader, it has everything that could make it leader, but is, does South Africa have the ambition to project itself as a leader in Africa? and in Sadak, and is that manifest in its policy, in its approach, or South Africa would rather act as a fire, uh, what do you call it, a fire fire, yeah. uh, or an ambulance when there's a problem in Zimbabwe, or an undertaker who comes now to pronounce who or no who, I can't tell, it's too late to do a pathological report, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, colleagues, I'd like to hear your views on, on, on these issues, then I will open up to hear from the colleagues. Is that for you? Is Sadak dead? Not the organization, but the solidarities that kept us together. The idea of oneness. Is that idea that we are one dead? Do our people self-identify? When you go to East Africa, East Africa, the East Africans say we are East Africans. We can move around each other's borders with the ID card. When you go to West Africa, there's a West Africa identity. The West Africans will say, because I'm West African, I have an Apple passport. 
this sadak that you were carrying bags uh, and making tea for the elders to uh, has it died with your tea bags? <laughs> so professor. So thank you for this question. So, so um, we've actually done quite a bit. There's a lot of miscellaneous text things that is about looking into these issues of misinformation, disinformation, and that sort of thing. But I think the really important point of your question, and, and, and technology can can carry this. I'm not sure whether we can blame the multinational corporation ownership of those platforms. And there's a lot about that as well. But I think the question of what the narrative is now to me is really interesting. And I, I, in my opinion, in my observation. I think we're quite far, and you see, I look at the rhetoric in this election from an I am African kind of narrative. I think we are very much, at least what appears to be a popular narrative is we are at risk of immigrants spoiling everything. Um, and therefore, uh, really, a lot of advocacy around a fairly retrogressive migration, even refugee uh, 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 policies. Uh, and I think a very strong nationalistic narrative, actually, which I'm not sure. I suppose if we trust that a strong South Africa would be good for the region, then that could be okay. Uh, but I'm not sure I see the strength of the saddest arguments for regionalism in the kinds of statements that I see in, 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 in the narrative uh, uh, as you speak it. However, I think what I was trying to think earlier was the difference perhaps between what we see and what appears to be popular and what we also hear on another level of society and activism that perhaps is not as powerful as it could be, should be, that actually uses a very safe technology to push a different narrative. Uh, and I think that narrative doesn't have quite the same stage and presence because sometimes what matters is not just who is uh, you know, you know, on, on, on the apps, but perhaps who's on the mic and who's on the TV, and that's a different level of, 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 of participation. So I do wonder to what extent, you know, it's interesting the idea that young people check out of politics. I think we could also deal with that a little bit. We did see now with the digitalization and the education numbers go up among the demographics, so that might say something. But what you also see now, they're sort of looking at some of these youth driven uh, websites, uh, is people trying to encourage people. Uh, to vote because there's also a recognition that people are saying, ah, it's useless, not because they are pathetic, but because they're really concerned about what's in front of them. So I, I don't know whether we have the ability to pick that up uh, in any way. I think the easier thing is to say, well, these are pathetic or, uh, or, or they don't care. Uh, and I'm not necessarily sure that that's what we see or what we are hearing, uh, at least in some of the solutions where we are. I think technology really is just a uh, way of that. Let me push you a little on that before I get to evil. Um, ultimately, when the push comes to shove, if technology was just a conveyor, the Americans found themselves in talk. The Americans fought, were even willing to fight South Africa so that China does not get the. Uh, just a little, a little materialist needs for. So technology can't just be a, a platform. Technology is a uh, survival issue in security and sovereignty. And the fact that uh, it's owned elsewhere and you need to pay fees, importation, you don't have intellectual property rights, does matter ultimately. Whether. At least that's the conversation we were having. I see. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm just saying to you. So when you look at the elections and the deployment of technology, how much the Americans claim that the Russians sitting in Leningrad and uh, someone influenced their election in DC. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, to what extent can the election in South Africa and public opinions be technologically influenced mm -hmm. elsewhere? So, beyond what the young people are doing. So, of course, they can be, but they can use a small anecdote here. Um, in another election last year, a good friend of mine and I were having a conversation about all of the sophisticated things we thought could be done digitally to kind of, you know, mess up the election. Uh, and I remember just after the election happening, him sending me a message very irate, saying, you know, he's very disappointed to see that after all of our imaginings of what people could use tech to do, the very sophisticated technology people ended up using to steal an election was just tech. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. You are going for a particular age, right? And gender, right? But the point being that there's a lot of technology can be used for. The question is, is that the concern of South Africa right now? 
and then I'm not convinced because so I've been part of conversations where people will then raise that, you know, whether it's the Chinese or the tech or the Russians or the Spanish. So my person, my person was fair, so. So the electoral outcome in South Africa, South Africa has always had very well managed. In fact, South Africa has managed its elections better than the US. So my conversation, perhaps I should have indicated, is not about whether or not South Africa can manage this election technically. It's not the outcome question. I know uh, the outcome question would have to go to the north. Eh? Uh, so my question was about the dealing with the uh, an election uh, uh, works up public sentiment, which does not retire when the when the election is done. So I was thinking about the sort of influence that that's shaped and shaping attitudes towards. Uh, uh, migrants and co obstruction, or whether it's not just migrants, towards each other, towards social cohesion, and etc. Yeah. Lest, uh, lest people think I'm a hater. Sorry, I interrupted you. are about to finish. Yeah. Yeah, people. Do you remember the question? I don't, I don't want to remember it, but anyway. Well, I'll make that. Is that. Some of these issues are extraneous to relations, as we know them. Secondly, I want to, well, I shared the idealism, euphoria of my young man, David Martin, and uh, nostalgia of them. I was also there when they suddenly yes. signed, first of April 1980, and when the Sunday was signed in 1992. Let me be clear. I think we need to run away from this idea of Southern African exceptionalism. Some of us have long shared ourselves on that, on the basis of the reality of the club. It is just not true. It's like Southern religion is also I have been uh, on the pilgrimage recently to Dar es yeah, for the various sentiment. And I was amazed the extent to which East Africa has moved ahead of South Africa. In every respect. In every respect. Um, economically, especially. I won't say Turkey. Tanzania. Uganda, not to mention Kenya, have 30 years ahead of my country. But in terms of regional integration, the point that Brian made about the uh, free movement, literally freedom of movement um, of the populations of seven countries is a reality. No good permits for almost the move freedom as a reflection of the, of the reality economically and even echoes understanding the problems uh, affecting it. They moved. In 2000, I went to Elbas, they had a passport. There was a feeling of, of real uh, regional integration in those regions. We are behind, and I'm sorry to say it. The arrival of South Africa in Southern, in fact, made, made, a, made a regression in the idea of Southern. Is the point of it? has regressed. While, while, uh, while at the same time, it's, it's been a very Reluctant hegemon. We decide reluctant hegemon. Unable to place responsibility as a hegemon in the way that Nigeria had played it. I mean, South Africa is virtually useless in South Africa. Yeah, put it very bluntly. No, it is, not, it is of no consequence. Sorry. Let me say so. We are more concerned about South Africa. We need to ask questions. Why is it only in South Africa where there is this Afrophobia? We need to ask those questions. We don't see it anywhere else in the, in the, on the continent. These are the questions we asked. You need to also raise the bigger question, which I raised earlier on, which all of you glossed over. The national question in this country, you know? And the fact that uh, the social structure of South Africa is no different from the other structures uh, in the region. I mean, where the uh, Tabo, uh, not, uh, Moletsimbeki speak at our forum the other day. 
and made the point that they have discovered in the research that only 0.04% uh, of the population really determines the outcome of elections in this country. I was I saw uh, a few days ago uh, an interesting thing on the streets of uh, Joburg where someone was distributing uh, ANC uh, shirts, t-shirts, and a street kid <laughs> was given one, and <laughs> when, he, when he felt he was secure enough, he threw it on the ground. <laughs> threw it away. Street kid threw away the ANC, and this guy was driving us an ANC stalwart. Shouted him that bring that t-shirt. <laughs> so the was in fear, picked it up and gave it to this. But so these are the. But I said to myself, but this guy, uh, I don't think he's registered as a voter. I saw the big uh, rally of uh, the EFF in uh, in Durban a few months ago, and it's packed. Yeah. But I wondered, yes, we have also wondered in Zimbabwe and elsewhere whether these people register as voters. So who determines the outcome of elections is a key issue, in my view. No, no I don't think it's technology has anything to do with it at all, uh, you know, except the one which is not known to everybody, the extent to which technology has been used to steal elections. Mm. I saw today in the papers, uh, Sophie, uh, that uh, the city press said that uh, ANC has invited ZANU-PF to assist. And someone said, well, <laughs> <laughs> they, have a, they have a lot to learn from ZANU PF when it comes to, to rigging. It's legion in Zimbabwe that elections are rigged. <laughs> it's a matter of course, actually, as uh, Obasanjo <laughs> told me. <laughs> so he told this young man who was standing for elections in Zimbabwe, that, are you, are you going to cope with the rigging? <laughs> so in a situation where rigging has become the, the pattern, cynical pattern, where the, the voice of the masses is not important anymore, except as cannon fodder. Why should we celebrate the elections, for heaven's sake? Huh? Okay. I agree. So, Ibu, just a little before I let you off the hook. <laughs> so, you know, I have I agree with you because uh, uh, I'm about to ask you a question to explain uh, your position. So, if, and I said I agree with you, elections don't matter, okay? Um, uh, it also may mean the idea of this representative democracy does not matter. Uh, and I recall coming to one of your platforms and arguing that if elections were the sole measure of democracy, the apartheid state and the Rhodesian state were democratic. Uh, uh, Jonathan Moyo writes uh, something similar. They held elections. They were regular. Among the ruling elite, they were fair. Uh, they were free. Uh, and then now I'm in this to the national question. We do need a practical way of including the historically excluded groups, both with the economy and within politics, and within the state in various forms. Uh, in your take, we take away this premium we place on elections. What might you see as pathways towards uh, resolving the national question as like the first practical steps? This is how we would deal with the uh, notorious diversities that we have, regional, ethnic, racial, and class. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I advisedly quoted from Sami Amin, uh, just to remind us where we are, mm -hmm. uh, that which renders our elections a poor imitation of the bourgeois democracy. Mm -hmm. I agree with those who say that the apartheid state, uh, like the Plato's uh, Greece, was bourgeois democracies, mm -hmm. the bourgeoisie, the, the 0.04%. Mm -hmm. That has been the reality. And we, in our pretense towards a mass democracy, we have uh, regressed into the bourgeois democracy for a few of us, mm -hmm. uh, where what Pareto uh, spoke about the circulation of elites. We're back in that, you know, and where the competition between the ruling party, which wants to retain power, 
and the opposition party, which was to gain power, with no, with neither, with neither having outlined a, 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 a policy position vis-a-vis -vis the national question, you know, mm -hmm. there isn't. There's, they shy away of, from it. We did the same in Zimbabwe until the 2000, when the ruling party was threatened with defeat. Mm -hmm. Then they resorted to populist and the narratives. And the narratives. So I have, I have no answer. I, I, I will only have to say the following, that uh, uh, the excitement of South African elections is against the backdrop of failed elections in the neighborhood. Then we had uh, elections in Senegal against the backdrop of uh, three coups in the region, Niger, Mali, and uh, Burkina Faso. And many or many people who are cynical about elections would began celebrating those coups. And I remember having a discussion with um, Bayo here and said, look, we need to stand up and say, look, coups are never democratic. Yeah, they are just as bad as a rigged election. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> so, Okay. So let's let's celebrate Senegal, for example, but let's be very clear and be circumspect about the coups. And let's so yes, to answer your question, yes, a good election is better than a, a bad election, of course. Okay. Yeah. Just one, you know, the argument South Africa's entry uh, collapses the Sadak uh, flavor. Some people have argued but that the longevity the tenacity for office and the corruption of the neighborhood leadership in the period post-1995-96 uh, is a partly catalyzed. The, they became themselves clients in the sense that they were worried about, for example, if you take a country, I think that uh, Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe particular policies around price controls and etc. Uh, and uh, some of their industries were moving here, the white flight, uh, flight capital, white cap whatever it was called at the time. And then you had something drastic. Zimbabwe's political leaders were moving some of the money into South Africa. So this idea that South Africa's opportunity lost to be a real benevolent hegemon, but there needs to be responsibility amongst how we cannibalized Mozambique, uh, cannibalized Zimbabwe, and some of the conflict that went to Zambia, uh, not just under liberation movements, by the way, but under, under part, other parties. Mm -hmm. Is there a failure of the pro pro project in Sadak that producing orphans, uh, citizens who are becoming not only hostile to the state, but who want to escape and are escaping to South Africa and causing the sort of tensions here? Yeah, well, I think basically we the two issues are separate. SADC has always lacked the institutional framework of being a SADC, a regional integration project. And it has got worse over the years. The expectation that South Africa's entry into it, not to, not to mention the fact that SADC began largely as an as a anti-apartheid movement mm -hmm. and so it, would, it appeared to some that once south africa became free the sadek um, project ended almost true but there was also hope with the with the sadc in 92 uh, that SADC would become an economic integration uh, project uh, given the obvious uh, benefits that accrue to regional integration bodies but it happened and these chances for that having happened would, was, were, were, were un, unregrettably, um, uh, South Africa could have done it. I remember I was in a meeting with Tabumbeke and others, 1993 in Kabarun, when we discussed the idea of two. One was to integrate the customs union with SADC. South Africa refused. The other one, less, less important, was to, to who confront the three major major obstacles or factors that, that militate against integration, namely vertical integration of the North, the problem of the, of the nation state, 
and the uneven and equal development between our countries and, and within our countries. So those are the problems. Thanks, Ivo. David, you are the hopeful one. <laughs> you are the, you are the, you, my brother, uh, if we were reassigning professions, I would make you the priest because you are good for <laughs> weddings, for birthday and for funerals. So, <laughs> uh, David, you've heard, you've heard this, um, your, your take was, it's not too late. We have to realize our South Africa's power, acknowledge it, and leverage it. And you re reference various aspects in which South Africa is powerful. And that this election and South Africa are both consequential. Right. Have you changed your mind after hearing your colleagues? <laughs> no. No, I haven't changed, uh, Brian. I have had my senior colleague, and uh, I, I respect his views. You know, as uh, Jen Jackson also says, uh, a variety of opinion is welcome and is encouraged. <laughs> so I, I think I'm out. <laughs> oh, go. <no. laughs> but um, what I think I want to say, and I agree with you, uh, Ibu, <clears throat> is that elections don't mean democracy. Elections on their own are not a democracy. And because uh, we have a good example here in the name of uh, Iswatini, just next door. But I think there is a mistake that we often make, uh, and I'm, we must acknowledge this. We tend to think that uh, democracy is an automatic process. Mm -hmm. We tend to think that democracy is a spontaneous process. It has never been meant to be. If you look at the history of democracy across the world, be it in America, be it in France, wherever, uh, the history of democracy has always been fought for. So for democracy to succeed in any country, in any region, uh, it needs forces that work for it. But in our sub-region, uh, we find that those forces are tightly controlled. The space for them to operate, it is tightly controlled. So I think we need to acknowledge that. So there, these are the forces that are supposed to be aiding, facilitating, helping to push for accountability, for transparency. But you'll find that across our countries, because of the politics Igbo, the politics of consensus within the SADC, uh, whereby uh, these leaders <laughs> have to go to, to hold this consensus for, it is working against this integration project mm -hmm. that they are trying to build. So I think we have, we have to appreciate that aspect, that uh, democracy, it is not a, a, a spontaneous process. But now, uh, uh, Brian, to the question that you asked, uh, South Africa, in my, in my view, in terms of potential, there's no doubt about it. But we are all aware that, as he rightly pointed out, in part he's answered my question, that South Africa is a, is a reluctant leader. Um, probably like uh, you were giving the, the example of Nigeria, uh, and uh, say Germany, say in, within Europe, for instance. So it, is, it has the potential, but it is not coming out there. Uh, because we find that within this uh, regional grouping, at times South Africa is competing uh, with uh, the regional members, especially if you were to give an example of economic partnerships. We have seen South Africa going all out to compete uh, in, in, as a way of advancing its own economic uh, uh, partnership. So it is uh, at times coming uh, to the uh, picture as a, um, a fire brigade, for instance to switch off some fires like we've seen like they're, they're doing in, uh, in Mozambique. So, but if South Africa were to play its rightful position, uh, it were to play its role, I think there is potential for South Africa to be a leader within uh, this uh, uh, critical region that we're talking about. I appreciate the point that we're making that uh, uh, the EAC has made some progress, that I, I admit, just like ECOWAS. But I was simply talking about the element of stability. That I was making a reference to. Thank you. Uh, so, David, I wanted to follow up, but because I want to hear from those who have come in the audience, just one small thing from your uh, perspective. Democracy has to be fought for. Mm -hmm. uh, or Issa Shifji says, human rights and democracy are outcomes of social struggle. Mm -hmm. And you are saying the space for social struggle is constrained. Now, 
some might argue, well, if you, or oh, uh, President um, Seveni, please don't show him his, this video. <laughs> uh, a group went to see him, and they were talking about, oh, Mr. President, uh, this opposition, there's no openness, transparency, and et cetera. And he gave a long story about going to your neighbor saying, I'm going to hunt. You, you remember the story. Yeah. And then he ended by saying, transparency is not nakedness. <laughs> Now I I I I need to go back to the to the point to the point. I need to go back to the point that that's, that Prof was saying. Transparency is not nakedness. So, in a world where the Americans uh, openly express hostility towards South Africa's position at the ICG, and given the histories of regime change that have been transacted by some powerful states and small states. Uh, where do you draw the line between openness and nakedness? I've got no answer to your question. <laughs> I refuse to answer your question, but, but, I, still, but I still maintain, uh, Brian, that um, South Africa, hold a promise for the region. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it does hold, indeed hold a promise for this region. Mm -hmm. It is only that South Africa, if you look at the institution that it has, in terms of the judiciary, in terms of the chapter nine institutions, which are well entrenched in, in terms of its constitution, mm -hmm. I think South Africa has got positive lessons that it can project out there uh, to other countries. Let me just give an example of Botswana, mm -hmm. where the president of the country uh, is the country and the country is the president mm -hmm. in, in terms of the powers that uh, he enjoys in terms of the constitution. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of these executive powers, and I think that can be said about even our, some of our neighboring countries, if you look at the executive powers of the president. But in the case of South Africa, mm -hmm. we are fortunate in the sense that they still have what we can call, relatively speaking, of course. The, the, yeah. the president has another business other than the country. <laughs> In, in what me, way are you fortunate? Let, yeah, let me continue. <laughs> At least here, yeah, you can count on the judiciary as the last line of defense. I see. Okay. Yes. Yeah, thank you. You know, Mao Tse-Tung, colleagues, I can see you're almost sleeping. Mao Tse-Tung described this process called substitutionalism. Substitutionalism, according to Mao Tse-Tung, I know you call him Zedong, to <laughs> Mao Tse-Tung was the people are substituted by the vanguard, vanguard, vanguard party, party, the political party. The political party is substituted by the central committee. The central committee is substituted by the politburo sure. or the political bureau, right? And, uh, oh, okay, so Ibo, Ibo who says uh, they did it the other way around in Zimbabwe. All right, so the, the politburo is closer. And then all of them are substituted by the party leader. So often when you see the party leader sitting alone in his uh, garden drinking tea and eating sumptuously, you must know the people are eating. Mm. There's no hunger in the country. <laughs> and then when he stands up and says, the people say, he's referring to himself Him. and himself <laughs> and himself. So what you are describing in this country in Sadak uh, is substitutionalism, Zach. Mm. Uh, <laughs> Transparency and nakedness. This uh, <laughs> we need space for civil society. We need democratic space, free space for political parties to compete, freedom of the media. We need to make sure that judiciaries are independent. We need to all these things. And somebody has said, "Hang on, you've been independent thirty years. Have had these efficient bureaucracies." Yet poverty has increased and inequality at industrial rate. Mm. Efficiency of the bourgeois state, inefficiency of the ability for it to do a democracy that delivers outcomes for the people. So your reflection on the geopolitics and the this link between an efficient, transparent, uh, what's the other way? It gets all the right ratings in the... Uh, Freedom House, uh, Open Society, uh, all these people who rate democracy, they, they rate you and give you triple A rating, but your own people are like, ah, 
safa sapela isizwe simnyama so what's your take first of all let me say that uh, <clears throat> you know uh, this issue of a uh, that was picked up by david that um uh, you know, is not sufficient uh, to proclaim a state as a democracy. You need to build democracy, you need to build institutions, you need to build the leaders. You know, when Thabo Mbeke was asked to campaign for the ANC first, uh, he described some of the words to be led by criminals. What should he tell to this criminal to lead, to lead the country? Unfortunately, some of our leaders, they have those functions in their words, they have this, they, they, those functions in, in their uh, party structures that they represent, which means that one of the fundamental issues that we don't talk about is crisis of leadership across the board. In the country, in the party structures, in the words, and even regional. So this, if I go to a region, I mean, a leader of my region, uh, to talk about, uh, um, it, yeah, the criminals are funny. Yes, the criminals are. <laughs> so uh, if I go to talk about Sadak, a person who has been elected in politics, to eat or to protect the interest of his own group and talk about Sadak, will he ever understand me? I think the interest has shifted and we don't talk about how to take the issue of leadership in the region in a serious manner. How do you build leaders? How do you train? What are those institutions? I mean, in other countries, more developed ones, there's a tradition that you go to school A, school B, school C, and then all the people that are... They still produced drama. <laughs> those schools. Yes. I don't think so. He didn't go to a, some of these schools that I'm talking about. Okay. So if you went to those schools, you will have the same culture. You will be talking about the issues the same aspirations, and you're yeah. going to lead institutions that matter. And even if you're not a brilliant student, mm -hmm. they will do everything that you get a degree from A or B or C institution that matters, that will take you to be a CEO or, or a political leader somewhere. So there is a, a, cultural, a culture which is built somewhere Somehow, people talking the same language, people developing the same intentions, not in, only in their own country, but globally, some of them. So, but we are limping behind in talking about these issues. We think that if uh, today David wants to become a politician, regardless, if he is a good speaker and he f finds the right connections, he can be promoted and he can become a leader. But that doesn't take him anywhere. It doesn't take the continent anywhere. It doesn't take his country anywhere. Mm. It only takes him. But what is a leader? What are the institutions that are building leaders of ANC here in South Africa today? Which are the institutions that are building political leadership in Zimbabwe? Only some days ago, I mean, some weeks ago, that uh, the uh, Shitepo Institute or School of Ideology <laughs> has been built in Zimbabwe. All these years, there was no an institution training a cadre for leadership, teaching them that, you know, this is how the state works. This is how the administration should be done. This is how things should be. These are the values of a, of a, of a, a civil servant. Uh, these are, this is what needs to be done. So we get a degrees, 
with masters and doctorate, or some people they will get a technology uh, technology degrees, mm -hmm. and then the opportunity is there. We suddenly assume that because we've been elected by the people, we know how to lead, and we have not taken the issue of leadership in a very serious manner. Okay. So this is one of the issues that contributes to the SADC that we have today. I mean, but the idea, the dream is still there. We have not worked on the mechanisms and the instruments to make it work. We have not taken that seriously. Mm. And uh, maybe this is where we should be doing. Maybe this is what we should be thinking about and uh, actually doing in our political parties and uh, in our institutions and uh, other things. So we, we, we just debate. We go to the meetings, we come to the meetings on SADAC. So we take decisions. Mm -hmm. And when we finish taking decisions, we go around with our documents and they will be in the drawers. Nobody's reflecting about those policies. Nobody's thinking about the consequences of those policies. And it has been like that for many years since the exemption. I mean, apart from that period, you know, SADCC, when we were struggling for it, independence of other countries or reducing a dependence on apartheid South Africa and uh, the likes. But then when we became, South Africa became free, uh, we were hoping that South Africa was going to embrace and taking this issue of leadership, the hegemon that could lead. But the hegemon had problems at home. That dark part of the rainbow that we can't define the color with the rest of the rainbow colors they didn't speak eye to eye. They didn't have a common understand. They didn't have a common project. How can you take that as a base to lead the rest of the continent? It's okay. very difficult. Unless we fix things like those in our own homes, each state. So we will be uh, you know, having problems in each of our own states because we are not tackling the right issues. We're not tackling the right problems, the basics in which these nation states are supposed to be functioning. I deliberately didn't ask the question of youth. I deliberately didn't ask the question of women's political leadership and representation. I deliberately didn't ask any question about the role of money in politics, whether the Sadak democracies have become or are way beyond the poor person's reach, not even a poor person, even the lecturers and academics and others who do ordinary jobs and don't steal cannot afford to run a campaign. Colleagues, you've listened to a diversity of views. So I would like to get five questions Five questions, I've got one in front here. Five questions, comments. Uh, anybody else? I've got one at the back. We're only seeing the, the men asking questions. I'm quite sure my sisters, you have questions and comments to put the panel in order. Let's start right there, sir. Oh, sorry, where? The woman there, straight uh, Let's... Huh? Oh, le yeah. Let's let's start. Let's start. Yeah, let's start at the back and build back up. Yeah. Hello. Um, I wanted to comment and also ask on the issue of Afrophobia, mm -hmm. specifically here in um Afrophobia. South Africa. So I do agree with Ibo about the regression of um what do you how did you explain it but i'll, I'll give it an example of ECOWAS, for example like i'm very jealous of how functional it is of how you can move in the entire western region without needing a um 
a visa, you know, you can just wake up and go conduct business and it costs less for them to do business with each other. And down here, it's almost like we're divorced, yet we are Nguni people. We should be able to relate even more in that aspect. And my question or comment rather is, as South Africa, where are we going wrong in educating people on our similarities? How do we, how are we always finding ourselves in a place where we find differences rather than similarities? Because we are very similar in culture, in thinking, in, in who we are as a people, because essentially we are the same people, but somehow there's this ignorance of each other that we don't actually realize that our differences, are, our similarities are more common than our differences. We constantly need to find the differences. And I wanted to comment on what you said on transparency versus nakedness. So in my opinion, I would say transparency is important in the sense that we don't want to find ourselves in the situation that Zimbabwe is sitting on where we constantly need to rig the elections to maintain the status quo. But it, at the same time, we don't want to invite our enemies into our space to dictate how we do things, to, 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 to determine what our policies should be, or else they will not give us support in the sense of the World Bank or whatever in the support they claim they give us. So transparency, would be free and fair elections, but should not be determined by America what free and fair is. But we should also stop allowing, um, somebody called it the geriatric mafia, <laughs> our political leaders to keep leading us down the path where we have Zimbabwe that is sort of stagnant, constantly blaming outsiders for our demise, not realizing that maybe the geriatric mafia is keeping us there and it benefits them. You know, if the master is full, then everybody is full type of thing. So I think we do need to, we need to, I think technology can help us with transparency. However, we should not be naive to think our enemies want transparency. They want nakedness. Mm. Sometimes it's friends, my sister. I, I heard and 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 this statement could can be misinterpreted. That your best friend could really get your uh, you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, so it's not always enemies. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's we, policy. That's yeah, you know. <laughs> I um I we had another question there. Where's the gentleman? There, there, right there. No, the gentleman here. Thank you, panel. I'm not a gentleman. My name is Chele Tabunyani. Please, on record, I come from the International Criminal Court of Justice. I have practiced here in the High Court of South Africa and I've lectured here in the School of Governance. I have a few questions and I'm not going to be I'm or I'm yeah. quite perturbed. Yeah, please, okay. please remind me your name. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, can you were, your voice was slightly yes. low. Yeah. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, sir. First question, number one. I come from International Criminal Court of Justice. Mm -hmm. It's a senior counsel. My question is number one. We have never made up issue of digital intelligence in terms of law how we integrate it. Number two, Ibo, I've written a PhD about democratic consolidation. When we talk about democratic consolidation, we have been very naive. Yes, we have to talk about what you call just the stability of social economic rights. And you don't talk about it. If I was to go back, so many cases, democracy is not about institutions. It's about social economic rights. 
and you, you are naive about it. Access to water, access to electricity, access to food, that's what we need as you vote for elections. That's what I need to understand in terms of international criminal law. I practice. And then I'm going to go to the next speaker, who is also my colleague. When you sit down about cultural anthropology, I'm worried. Kuti. Where are indicators in terms of monitoring and evaluation? We cannot keep on having same people. When case law has clearly indicated the issues that have been not been addressed. So in short, I will cut it. Ivo, can you address the issue of democratic consolidation? Social economic rights, just the stability of social economic rights, first generation of social economic rights. Don't talk about institutions, go about access to water, access to what? Yes, go to my PhD, go to my LLD, you'll find them. I talk about it, but you don't shove. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. There is a gentleman at the back. Can I just see another set of hands? I'm certain there are feminists here who must debunk all after things we said. I'm certain there are anarchists here, and I'm certain there are liberal scholars here who must, uh, you know, this is this room is too normal. So, sir, there's a yeah. We'll start with my sister at the back. Then there's a gentleman to the extreme left. Yeah, uh, yeah. The gentleman to the extreme right. Awesome. Um, thank you so much. This is Shengi Wenlovo. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a staff member here at uh, the school. Sorry, my, my sister. I, I'm i sitting with uh, senior citizens. Kindly raise your, <laughs> raise your, <laughs> raise your voice. Uh, Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, that's better. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I was saying my name is Teng Iwe and uh, I'm a staff member here at the School of Governance. Um, my question really is um, not a question per se, but a question as well to, um, to, um, to hear the responses from the, from the panel in terms of thinking through um, South Africa in relation to broader global politics. And um, this question is uh, sparked by some of the conversations around the location of South Africa leadership role within the, the continent, uh, the discussion that has been ongoing, but to say, how do we think about South Africa um, in relation to global politics because um, if we want to understand how um, South Africa has fought in the past 30 years of democracy, we cannot do that. Um, taking an ahistorical perspective, but also um, the many global events that have been happening, number one, the transition period from um, 1990 to 1994, and how that coincided um, with the end of um, the Cold War and the triumph of um, neoliberalism, uh, so to speak broadly, and um, what are the, to think about some of the choices that uh, South Africa had. And this is not to take away the responsibility of, um, you know, um, the, the leadership of the country, but to say, how do we think about those issues in relation to broader, to broader um, economic political um, events that are happening globally and how South Africa has been um, positioned within this politics and um, some of the negotiations um, that uh, the South African government uh, in, in relation to its um, foreign eco economic policy, they had to make those choices, but also in broader issues such as uh, the current position within um, the Israel-Palestine issues and how um, you know, the conversation within the space in response to that has been happening. So um, perhaps um, 
the question that I'm asking is without excusing uh, South African leaders from their responsibilities, how do we think critically about their position in global politics and about their role within the continent um, in relation to broader politics and uh, some of uh, the challenges uh, that are shaping socioeconomic and political choices that the country has been making? Thank you. Thank you, Tleng. Uh, there is a gentleman right at the corner there wearing a, a beard. <laughs> you know, I did, I did, I discovered it. So yeah. there's somebody else. Yes. Yeah. The thanks, oh, yes. Uh, thanks, Brian, for uh, for allowing us to to be able to talk. My name is Munjodzi Mutandir, and I'm with an organization called the Southern Africa Liaison Office. Um, we work on uh, dialogues around foreign policy and uh, some of these issues. Uh, I, I wanted to check the panel. Um, Josie, I, I'm not sure why you are using your voice for other spaces here. <laughs> Please, uh, my brother, raise, raise it a little so that... Uh, Is the mic working, though? Uh, yeah, yes. it's not the mic, it's the speaker. <laughs> oh, okay. So I'm not sure if... Uh, I have to shout or they have to increase the volume. Okay. Oh, okay. Perfect. So the first question that I had is uh, in terms of the impact of the elections, South Africa's elections on Sadakis, what informs South Africa's foreign policy? Do we know the values that underpins or give South Africa the approach they take um, in the region, but also globally? So I think that's a question that I would want to hear uh, some texts from, from the learned panel. And uh, would you be correct to say that um, there is a sense of exceptionalism to South Africa that has been very detrimental uh, to what it does in terms of helping develop this region? For example, you have a South Africa that goes to the ICJ uh, and ask uh, the court to really stop Israel from doing some of the things that we have seen happening in the region, in their neighbors, in Zimbabwe, in Swaziland in June 2021, uh, massive violence. Uh, last year's election in Zimbabwe, the ANC observer mission and other people from South Africa who were in Zimbabwe uh, sort of agreed with the SADC statement that that election was no election. But publicly, South Africa doesn't do uh, a lot. So my question is, would this election change how South Africa... Remember also, this is the same South Africa that sacrificed Libya at, at a global level. And, and, and I'm trying to, to understand uh, from the panel if really um, it's correct, as Ibo puts it, that maybe South Africa is useless to the region because it is unable to use its leverage. <laughs> no, you didn't say it in these words, <laughs> but it is unable to use its leverage to really help its neighbor. Then the last question is around the young people. I think that one of the things that uh, uh, we need to begin to in, uh, interrogate is when we talk about SADAC, who are we referring to? Is it that's just a group of those elected um, um, uh, guys who go and sit and support each other even when there are problems? Or we have to begin to take SADAC to the citizens. The disconnect between the young people in the region, which is why we are seeing opposition movements getting stronger and stronger and strong because young people do not feel that they are being represented uh, by those that are, that are in power. Is there a case uh, for SADAC to sort of change the way it has operated, allow civil society, allow young people, I allow citizens to have a serious voice on the developments uh, in this region and not leave it to a few people uh, in leadership in the different countries. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mjodzi. I'm reminded of your countryman, uh, Jonathan Moyo, who asked the question, can, uh, can those in power reform themselves out of privilege? <laughs> out of power. <laughs> Gorbachev. <laughs> Gorbachev did. Good afternoon. Thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. Kakoro, and uh, together with your panelists there. This is a very interesting uh, debate. Uh, I've got a comment in the question. Let me start with the comment, which is directed towards my brother there, uh, David to what he said about South Africa uh, being a giant, but uh, reluctant to uh, store its power towards its neighboring countries. Maybe I'm wrong, correct me, including the house here. I remember very well when the late president, Mr. Nelson Mandela, when he first took power in 1994, when he was spelling out South African uh, domestic policy and foreign policy. One of the things he mentioned was that South Africa's position is not going to be like that of the old administration, which we all know. Intervention. Which used to detect terms to its neighbors, to command, to tear. He said, we're not going to uh, show that big brother attitude, but we will assist wherever we are asked to assist by some multilateral organization like the United Nations, Commonwealth, uh, African Union, rather than to appear like we are bullies. I'm done with you, brother uh, David. <laughs> I'm coming to you, Mr. Mandaza. How are you, sir? <laughs> Good to see you. You just mentioned, dear Mr. Mandaza, that uh, there is a statement which I also heard this morning on radio. That was radio uh, SAFM. Uh, one of the senior politicians of the ruling party, ANC, where she admitted that Yes, they've invited ZAN PF to come and help uh, with the elections. Now, that left me thinking deep. As you know, Mr. Mandas, you are from Zimbabwe, you know what is happening there. <laughs> Last year, the, the, the previous elections, which are still disputed today, there was a rumor that ZANU-PF won those elections because uh, one of the things they, they invited a certain organization from Israel, which helped ZANU-PF to rig the elections, to manipulate the electoral system. So that made me think that, oh, when the NC is going to work hand in hand with ZANU-PF, Really, are we going to have uh, free and fair elections? <clears throat> so, what if it turns to be true, what I'm saying, Mr. Mandaza, what do you think the ruling party will say uh, in light of what the ruling party, South African ruling party, that ANC, just went to the IC there to report to what Israel is doing, the atrocities in Palestine? Thank you, sir. Um, colleagues, the energy levels are okay. declining. What I'm going to do is to ask the panel, you don't have to answer every question. Just take the key highlights, and then we prepare to land. I'm going to start to the to my right, by no means my ideological yes. right, because it's the left of the room. And I'll end to my left, which is the right of the room. 
and I make no ideological statement uh, in so saying. So Zach will start. Let's maybe uh, I don't know three minutes, three minutes, and uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, I I wanted to respond to this issue whether South Africa is being a, um how can it detrimental detrimental to the objectives of the region or not by going to taking Israel to court. I think <clears throat> to the International Criminal Court. Uh, my own taking is that uh, whatever foreign policy that we have, it needs to be principled. And uh, we can't exchange our development if those uh, 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 exchange our development or trade our development through selling our core values where our core values need to be reaffirmed we should reaffirm them i think the south african foreign policy at least in the instance of taking israel to the um, international court of justice is based on a violation of the right of self-determination of a court of of the people of palestine every people in the world are thinking have a right to self-determination, the principle of equality of states, um, humanitarianism, all those issues, they appear to be being violated with this ongoing conflict in Israel. So, uh, or in, 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 in Gaza. So if this is the basis, um, if these are the values that we all agree, I would not find it very difficult to agree with this um, uh, 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 position of South Africa, defending that not only with respect to what's going on in the Middle East, but uh, globally has a principle which orients its policy. Um, the other issue is uh, South Africa has come out of a solidarity. This apartheid system would never end if there has not been the role also of a solidarity that it played around globally, mobilizing different forces and different movements. So there's a, a, a number of issues that come out of there you know, you, 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 you cannot say that um, solidarity was good to end apartheid. Solidarity is not good to end uh, violence in, in Palestine or reaffirming the, the, the uh, uh, um, self-determination uh, of uh, Palestinian people. Um, so freedom... Um, self-determination, humanitarianism, and equality among states. I think these are is what is is being uh, um, and uh, proclaimed, and this is what South Africa has decided to engage in that uh, a battle with the rest of the world. I uh, mean, not the rest of the world; those who are claiming to reign or set the rules on how uh, the world should be functioning. Um, <clears throat> having said that, uh, I would also uh, try to say that the role of young people, it's very important. And one of the reasons why I am saying that uh, Sadak will not die soon. It's because young people are awakening more and more. And if you take the example of what has happened in Mozambique quite recently, um, there was uh, the older generation in Central 
committee meeting that has taken place to elect a new leader, uh, the older generation played a less role in contesting the list of candidates that was presented from which a candidate of the ruling party should emerge. So if it had not been the role of young people who energetically you know, uh, 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 fought against the decision of the political commission, which presented a list of candidates, and the meeting which was supposed to take place, I mean, finished in one day, it uh, was finished three, four days, to argue the inclusion of other candidates and not voting on the basis of the list which was presented by the political commission. So with this and the role, if you look at the movement in the creatives and uh, awakening of South Africa, even in the companies that are coming out of fashion, fashion and other, whether it's in the entertainment industry and others, invoking the cultural aspects of the African people and the need to reaffirm and affirm those. Uh, I'm saying that, that this in international and African consciousness of trying to awaken the African society and take those values um, and what we produce at home, what we produce as food and as uh, textiles and to put in the international markets and to say all this that we are doing also have values. For many decades, we, we, we didn't have a courage to do that, but young people are doing that for us. So there's a, a glimmer of hope that uh, the region and the continent is coming up and uh, they will take the leadership. They are ready to assume the leadership. Thanks, Zach. David. Okay, thank you, Brian. And uh, thank you once again for those questions and comments that we have raised. Let me start with the, the last one on <laughs> um, Zano PF. You know, my brother, I think uh, Zano PF is becoming a model in the region. The reason why, why I'm saying so is not only South Africa that has probably that is probably <laughs> borrowing some lessons from uh, the PF. Just recently, uh, just the beginning of this year, the Botswana IEC also went to go and benchmark in Zimbabwe. So you can see it is becoming a mod for the region. So I will, I will stop there on that one. <laughs> so, but uh, I think on the issue of uh, exceptionalism. I don't think I would put it that way. I think it is a culture within the SADC. If you look at the way South Africa operates, it is consistent with the principles that govern SADC. Uh, this aspect of ignoring excesses in our region is not new. We have seen South Africa ignoring them uh, in Zimbabwe earlier, in, in Swaziland, it's rather it's happening today. Uh, we have seen Botswana doing the same thing under Ian Kama. Uh, Ian Kama was criticizing Mugabe, but uh, forgetting about the king eh? next door. <laughs> so really, it is a static culture. So I think I don't think it's just something that is unique uh, to South Africa. So it is how SADC operates, uh, whereby they decided not to criticize each other uh, openly. And I don't think that is taking us anywhere. And uh, I know, Brian, sometimes they even talk about these African solutions for African problems, <laughs> which I have never seen. Uh, they always talk about that. That is, it has become a slogan somehow in some of the meetings, but I've never come to see these solutions that ultimately that they, uh, they do uh, present. So I think it's an issue of culture in terms of how the organization uh, operates. So basically, by going uh, to talk about Palestine, uh, for, uh, ignoring this, is not something that probably just unique South Africa. Even the other members of SADC uh, equally do uh, the same. But let me conclude by saying that you know, the critical challenge that I see within this region and beyond, uh, in fact, in our continent, is the issue of leadership. I think uh, Ibo made reference to it. It was that cow. Is it, uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, this, this continent 
has got a serious challenge of leadership deficit. I think that's why we should, we should look at it. He talks about um, uh, people being taken to schools to be able to appreciate certain values and cultures. We don't have that culture here. We don't have it. So we tend to think that uh, someone can just simply walk into a leadership, a leadership position and then they, they will exhale. It doesn't work. Uh, we have seen people like Mandela, they have done very well, but some of the leaders that we have had in this region, they have not done. Look at the challenges of unemployment that we are facing today in all these countries. Challenges of unemployment, corruption. So the challenges of un under, uh, the problems of underdevelopment in all these countries are quite serious. And that is why John Galton says that, uh, um, you know, this, this peace <laughs> that we seem to be enjoying today, it may not be there in the long term, as long as we have this challenge of structural violence. I'll end there. Thank you. Prof. So in um, architecture, we are taught that um, form follows function. And I think why it'll be a long time before we see African solutions to African problems is that I think there's a curious endeavor to sustain the form of things. Maybe it's because we've struggled for so long and argued for institutional building and institutional stability that I don't even think we know when those forms mm. are failing to function and when they need to change. And I don't know if we have the courage or the space to allow for different forms to emerge. Um, I like the point that was made by the lady at the back around um, uh, the jealousy about the mobility in ECOWAS and that sort of thing. Uh, so I don't know if it's urban legend or if it's true, but maybe a decade or more than go, I'm told that Paul Kagame commissioned a study to have somebody drive across the East African region. Uh, um, maybe you tell us if it's true or not, you might know by you. Um, uh, and in a way discovered all of the horrible delays. And by the way, if you really want to discover what's going on in Africa, don't, don't, don't fly from place to place. You'll probably be okay. Drive, try going through those borders and see what you will discover. Yeah. Uh, so we drove from here but to Botswana, to uh, Zambia, to Zim and back. What was really interesting was, on the one hand, the horrible bureaucracies that are completely un... Uh, if, if, you, if, you, if you think that actually we have harmonized, then I <laughs> don't know what we think we've harmonized, because it was terrible. Uh, but what we also experienced, and, and having flown to the same places is very disappointing, because then I wonder when we complain, I, I don't know if it's the people at Fixburg, Lokweng, and Beit Bridge who... <laughs> Should be all the ones at the airports because the airports are quite fine. But you know, this experience was really interesting. But what I also found was a wonderful humanity, actually. Mm -hmm. If you had the time, in any case, you are stuck there, so you could chat with people for a very long time. Um, uh, you also found that the very same officials, at least those who are not trying to get something from you, and many were not, by the way, trying to get anything from you, are also they think the systems are just as silly as you do. Mm -hmm. But there you are, paying here in this currency, paying there in dollars, paying for things that they can't even explain, uh, asked for papers that the other ones didn't ask for. I mean. It's really, it's really a mess. Uh, and what I felt in that was who, who is concerned about that? So who is concerned about that? Or are we okay if for those flying in, things seem fine? Are we okay with the fact that there appears to be a sub subaltern reality that at play in the region? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't know if many of you know, but even looking at uh, South Africa, our idea of what's running or, or paying for the economy, we maintain certain ideas and ignore others. So we will think a Sandton city or the big malls are good. We'll think downtown Johannesburg has collapsed and needs to be saved by the corporates. Uh, yet that same downtown Johannesburg will have, and there are studies to show this, an 11 block radius that actually generates more revenue than the whole of Sandton City or any of the other malls you think are the pillar of our economy. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I don't know who we are talking about, and I think somebody asked that when we talk about SADC, but I suspect we're not talking about people. Mm. Uh, and I think we are talking about forms. Uh, I'm not sure if we were to train more people, if they would be trained beyond <laughs> those forms. So I think there's something that needs to happen. And I think maybe I'll just end on, I think therefore to the point about uh, youth, which I think somebody referred to, uh, and I think even the question about, you know, can SADC allow young people? Or um, uh, I think the question also that was being asked about cult cultural anthropology and what are the indicators that allow us to keep on doing things that don't work. Uh, I think there are significant questions there beyond form. 
that have to be asked. And I think therefore to my response that looking at the manifestos, I did not see much beyond form. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we've seen one or two parties that have ventured outside and had conversations about some of these issues. I think to me, maybe that's a spark of promise, but of course you have to look at things holistically as well, not just the incident. Um, and, and so I, I think I would probably after this conversation retain my concern uh, and, and maybe this question of whether our form is functioning should be asked. Uh, my sister, let me address you, you not not as a prof. You know, we, as uh, your brothers, as men, we are not very um, verbal. It's all hidden there and written in the manifesto. That's why it's, it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's an intention. You know, <laughs> that's why we go to the African Union. So we have intention to build highways, build everything. And then we come back, we forget to tell our parliaments. That, uh, this, is to tell that this is what we agreed to in Addis. We go back the next year. You know, it's in the heart. It's a thought that counts. Uh, I know that, uh, I know that uh, that's why you need women leaders, because we as men, we mean well. Ibo? <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, <laughs> I was fascinated by the two questions from the two ladies there. The one, the first uh, had to do with why the the problem of ethnicity has been sustained even though apartheid is 30 years away. The answer to that is clearly uh, that whether you want to explain xenophobia or ethnic uh, rivalry, Within and be and uh, and between our countries, it, it has to do certainly with the colonial backdrop mm. and the apartheid era in particular, which highlighted or uh, highlighted and emphasized the differences or the perceived differences. I always remind uh, students of uh, the famous article by Achimafeje. Mm. The ideology of tribalism. Mm -hmm. Now, the, and the, the whole apartheid architecture was based on that ideology. Regrettably, it is an ideology which has been imbibed by the African elite leadership mm -hmm. itself, which they use expediently, as the case may be, and are, and therefore unable to stand up as they should to stay, say exactly what I'm saying publicly. And I've noticed, heard a clear statement from leadership in this country uh, uh, on, the, on, the, on the problem of xenophobia. It's explained more in denialism. Oh, you know, we, we are brothers and sisters, you know, we shouldn't be doing this to each other. But doesn't explain why we, it's why we have border controls between us. Why people must wait two years to get a visa to come into this country. The phobia against other Africans, it's incredible. You know, and it's really in Southern Africa where it's most pronounced. Because you talked about uh, the element as you go around the region. Well, I've been in East Africa and I've been in West Africa. It's even more human than that. You know, um, the language, of course, is also a factor, Swahili. And it is true uh, what you said earlier on that, and I think this is a lesson for Sadek. The, it appears to me the, that there is there's a class of people, mainly the class of rulers the, that have become, as Brian inferred earlier, the, what I call the comrade of bourgeoisie, people who have made money out of stealing and commissions, no doubt of production. And these border uh, corruption, in my country, in Zimbabwe, we have found that it's actually run by the elite, by cabals. And therefore, to address, and likewise, uh, the corruption in immigration, uh, customs, it's benefiting uh, uh, the elite, the whole cabals on that. And therefore, to address this thing uh, uh, 
centralist around SADC. Uh, it, 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 it doesn't help because these are just agents. In East Africa, the border controls affected the emergent African bourgeoisie in those countries. Uh, Kenya depends very heavily on Ugandan agricultural products. And quick movement, daily, daily movement. So the, the, the kind of uh, paperwork that's associated in Southern Africa at Bide Bridge or Churundu, no longer there in those countries. They got rid of it because the class that's involved is the class of production. In our situation in Southern Africa, as Africans, we are just agents of international capital. Our states, especially this state in South Africa, is a caretaker state. To enable the continuation of capital accumulation among those who are already rich. I mean, the white capital is safer now and post-apartheid than it was during apartheid. It's more secure. I was in Georgia last week. Hey, hey, don't talk. It's another world altogether. And, uh, and uh, when I keep talking about national question, maybe it's becoming boring, but I think that is exactly what affects South Africa. And I want to say in conclusion that we should stop harping on the liberation struggle and the liberation movements. Even though I was part of it, I'm embarrassed now at the abject failure of the post-liberation uh, phase. <laughs> Suffice to say, the liberation movements have long served their purpose. They should shut up and move on and let others take us forward. Thank you. Well, colleagues, there you have it. I think at this stage, we give the panel a pom-pom of appreciation. I mean, uh, I'm a child of liberation. Uh, I was born as, I am not sure whether they have served their purpose. Uh, you know, have you ever had uh, someone significant in your life that makes a promise? I know men get really hurt by this. So let's say when you were younger, because now I know you don't do such things. As someone who you love dearly makes a promise to come and see you, and then they forget, uh, and they don't come. How how do you feel? I've never been in that situation. <laughs> oh, oh, oh let, let, <laughs> let's uh, no, no, no. All right, we'll come here. <laughs> so you are the one who's been making promises. <laughs> <laughs> My sister, how do you feel? <laughs> <laughs> you know, a feminist from uh, Zimbabwe, or well, let me just call her an activist because I don't want to go into it, uh, walked into a room, found us having this intense debate with my brothers here, yeah, the late Masipula Stole and others. And of course, she was not a professor like the rest, nor a lawyer like the rest, nor, uh, but she gave the most powerful speech. And I want to use her words, not my words. Uh, her name is Priscilla Misaira Bwimshonga. She is now uh, <laughs> the ambassador. As, uh, a ZANU ambassador somewhere in France. No. Where? In Sweden. Sweden. So Priscilla had listened to the erudism of the intellectual class and activist class. And then she wanted to capture the national condition on the eve of the election. And she said, because we all had been talking about the potential, the potential, the potential of African democracy. Then she said, boys, never mind that everyone was older <laughs> than her, but she then said, boys, and I'll try and imitate the accents. Let me tell you about potential. My grandmother first met, I know she said, let me tell you about potential. Women are the only people who know 
what it means to fall in love with potential. My grandfather, my grandmother met my grandfather. He was young and stunning, but badly behaved. They were in their teens. And she kept saying, he has potential to make a good lover. Then as happened in those days, because they were playing around hedges and bushes, somehow they fell and she fell pregnant. <laughs> and he was still behaving badly. And she said, he has the potential to become a good husband. And tradition made him pay lobola. He paid. They now lived together. He was still behaving badly. And she said, well, maybe when the child or the children have grown up, he will become a good man, you know? And the children grew up until they became teenagers, and he was still behaving badly. And she was like, well, what can I do now? The children are old. If we start fighting now, it will destabilize the children. Maybe when the children leave home, he will realize that he's an adult now and behave. And the man was still behaving badly when the children had gone to university. She was now phoning their youngest child who was at university to try and deal with the delinquent father, right? Well, she says, well, we are old anyway. Maybe when the children get married and we have grandchildren, this man will grow up. They got grandchildren. The man was still behaving badly. And then she says, oh, maybe. You know, since we are old, we have grandchildren. When I die, mm -hmm. I know he will be a good companion. The man was never a good companion. Then she says, maybe he will bury me when I die. And the idiot died before she did. <laughs> All her life, she was in love with a potential. <laughs> right. And this is our story with the liberation and democracy in our region. I am grateful to the speakers for reminding us how much we've been in love with potential. And as we enter the rest of the uh, debates that we are going to have, I want the young people to remember the opening statement I made. The liberation of this continent has always rested on the restlessness of the youth and the refusal to wait for the potential to die or to bury them. Professor Adebayo Lukoshi, sir, representing the head of the school, Vitz, the panel and I are most grateful that we hope our potential has been shown. Thank you. I would like to end my remarks on thanking the facilitator and the panel members. I think that was a very enlightening uh, discussion. I was looking at our school group chat. At one time, Wi-Fi failed us. Then they said, I think Wi-Fi is listening that they are going to tell the truth, so they have to cut them off the entire world. Thank you so much. Uh, there are no words to express uh, your presence, your discussion, your truthfulness. And uh, I also want to add on to what you've said. The Dubai that you see and admire was not like that in the 1980s. It was actually a very dusty street. And for any of you who is 20 and you start to work on South Africa, you are going to see South Africa like Dubai when you are age 50. So I agree with you, facilitator. I, I think the youth should not wait for potential to die. They have to probably escort him out like we used to do. We never had prisons. 
we just used to chase you from the village. Then we actually decide on what we do. On those remarks and for the audience, uh, especially those online and the comments, and some of them are quite laughable comments, uh, but we are glad to know you are engaging. Thank you so much, colleagues, and have a lovely evening. Thank you.